Hello, thank you for participating in this webinar on the implementation of United Nations sanctions on North Korea and the challenges faced by African states. My name is Timothy Westmeyer. I am a project lead at CRDF Global, an international nonprofit organization that promotes peace, security, and collaboration around the globe. We hope this webinar will be a helpful tool for you to further build your capacity to identify and prevent activities that are designed to evade your country's financial and commercial regulations, as well as obligations established by the United Nations. I want to thank the United Kingdom's Foreign and Commonwealth Office for their support in helping us design and develop this webinar series. I am also honored to introduce the trainer for this webinar, Mr. Enrico Karish of Compliance and Capacity Skills International, or CCSI. He served the Security Council as a financial and natural resources sanctions monitor prior to co-establishing CCSI. He has developed UN systems-wide sanctions monitoring programs and training programs, and has authored implementation manuals for nonproliferation and sanctions enforcement. This webinar will cover a wide range of topics on UN sanctions enforcement related to North Korea, but it is designed to complement a terrific handbook on UN sanctions implementation written by CCSI, especially for the specific needs of, and challenges found in East Africa. This handbook is a comprehensive resource for your day-to-day -day compliance work and can be downloaded on CCSI's website, which can be found at www.comcapint.org, where you can find English, Amharic, Swahili, and other language versions of the handbook, as well as this webinar. We also have links to these materials on the top right of this webinar screen. You see a little box on the top right that says web links. Click one of those and you can get access to the uh, training handbook that I just mentioned. So without further delay, I turn the microphone over to Mr. Karish. Thank you very much and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Tim, for this nice introduction, and thank you very much for all the participants for your interest in this uh, important matter. I would like to first talk a little bit about how the UN sanction system uh, works. It starts out, of course, with the Security Council adopting sanctions resolutions uh, that almost always are adopted under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. There is, only in Artic there is only Article 41 that speaks to, to sanctions, although the term sanctions is never mentioned. <clears throat> but Article 41 provides the power to curb temporarily and under certain clearly defined conditions that are uh, articulated in Article 39 <clears throat> when the sovereign, re uh, sovereign res rights of a member state uh, can be restricted within imposition of sanctions. Sanctions adopted under Chapter 7 resolutions represent under international law binding obligations. All member states have to abide by them and those that ignore them risk that they become themselves subject to sanctions. It not only has, uh, san member states not only have the responsibility of states to implement all sanctions measures, their authorities also need to make sure that individuals, companies, and other organizations within their territory uh, report and violate uh, when they discover that sanctions are being violated. In many ways, African countries perceive North Korean, the North Korea's experiences over the past 100 years as very similar to their own. Occupied and exploited for decades by Imperial Japan, the North Koreans emerged out of World War II only to be caught again into a new contest over the control of Korea with a competitive regime in the southern half of their peninsula, the Soviet Union as their protector. <clears throat> Ever since, North Korea has been engaged in a cold war with the US, except during the period from summer, from summer to 1950 to 1953, when the whole hot war, known as the Korean War, raged. Koreans were able to relate their experiences in a pragmatic fashion to other developing countries 
who have suffered from colonialism, occupations, war, and exploitations of their populations and natural resources, as well as cultural domination and ongoing military threats. Economic instabilities and endemic human rights violations are blamed by North Korea, as sometimes other governments around the world tend to do, to the colonial and post-colonial legacies, usually in contradiction of Western claims that the true causes are corruption, the autocratic rule, and mismanagement. North Korea has fostered its relationship with many developing countries for many decades. In addition to successfully advertising its Juche interpretation of Marxist ideas, the concept of self-sufficiency uh, formulated by Kim Il-sung, the founder of the Kim leadership dynasty, North Korea has been pursuing aggressive bilateral diplomatic relations supported with cultural and educational exchanges. A key component in this strategy was early on the provision of military supplies, training, and logistics. These exchanges began long before UN sanctions were applied in late 2006. With the introduction of the UN arms embargo, these legacies are now a burden that African states have to face. Examples of existing military stocks that require, after all, ongoing military training, supply of spare parts, maintenance and repairs, all of which are prohibited under the UN sanctions. Examples of pre-embargo situations that could lead to embargo violations are Angola's $95 million worth of SA-2 missiles, BMP-1 and BMP-2 armored personnel carriers, and training for Angolan military aviators. Ethiopia also faces a similar legacy issue with the Gafat Armament Engineering Complex, munitions factory in Ambo, the Hamad Artillery and Mortar Ammunition Factory, financial support for uh, the construction of Halep Island shipyard, all by North Korea. <clears throat> Since the imposition of UN sanctions, bilateral trade involving military goods has generally decreased significantly, as an analysis of contrade data shows. However, as the examples of Colombia or Fiji demonstrate, there are still sizable arms transactions in play after sanctions were imposed in late 2006. The buildup of DPRK's arm trade, manufacturing, and reverse engineering capability was accomplished with great speed. An example. Syria sold in 1996 to North Korea a Tochka miss missile that North Korea redesigned, and this model led to development of the Hwasong-11 short-range ballistic missile. It is now reported to be further on the further improvement and de development for the eventual development of anti-ship rockets. A similar development can be observed when North Korea acquired from Egypt in 1980 the Scott B missile, and only a few years later was already able to engineer the acquired technology into what we now call today uh, North Korea's Hwasong 5, 6, and 7 rockets, which it has sold to a number of states, including the United Arab Emirates, Iran, Syria, Vietnam, or Libya. Here is a snapshot taken in summer 2017. Here is a snapshot taken in summer 2017 of what missile experts consider the DPRK's most important offensive mi missile arsenal. This excludes the ones we discussed before. Note the capabilities of some of these missiles. North Korea has now stretched its ability to attack targets from those very nearby, short, with short-range missiles, to intermediate and local uh, places located, and as well as places located across the globe on any other continent. And finally, we see how North Korea 
uh, is able to leverage its growing missile technology competence to build its nuclear arms proficiency. With Pakistan's infamous AQ Khan and the, it, his Khan research laboratories, North Korea bartered its advanced missile technology against the Pakistanis' ability to produce highly enriched uranium technologies, circumventing reporting obligations to the International Atomic Energy Agency under the agreed framework. For African countries, the bilateral trading with the DPRK poses not only the normal challenges of fully complying with UN sanctions that can be formidable. For countries who rely on North Korean military supplies, to some extent, they face a collision of their national security interests with security interests of the international community. This contradiction has to be addressed. The affected states must be supported with capacity building assistance. Otherwise, it's illogical to expect their full compliance cooperation, and it certainly would not be helpful to threaten these countries with secondary sanctions. Oh, there is a question. Why are there sanctions on North Korea's nuclear weapons program, but not on the nuclear weapon program of the UN permanent five countries? Well, as a matter of fact, this is true. Uh, we, we have China, France, uh, Russia, the United Kingdom, and, and the US as the permanent five, but we have also India, we have Pakistan and Israel, who are uh, nuclearized states. And that, of course, is a contradiction. It seems to be a contradiction that they can legally have a nuclear arsenal, whereas North Korea and before Iran were denied that, that ability. Well, the reason why it is uh, appropriate to impose sanctions against North Korea is a very simple one the international community, practically every country in the world, has signed a number of international agreements that are binding. Uh, and the fir very first uh, UN sanctions resolution that was adopted in late 1946 actually dealt with this particular issue uh, by stating that while no other country should develop nuclear weapons, those that already have nuclear weapons are actually under an obligation to denuclearize their, their arsenal. When we look at the specific uh, operational uh, intentions that uh, UN sanctions have, we can uh, perhaps first distinguish three categories of UN sanctions. The core measure in UN sanctions is almost always an embargo against arms, blocking the, the delivery of conventional arms and, of course, weapons of mass destruction, including any components or technologies, in this case, to North Korea. In support of the central idea of depriving negative actors access to the means to inflict violence, commit atrocities, or wage illegal wars, the UN bans and embargoes also curtail the trade with commodities or exploit human labor. As a specialty ban only applied to North Korea, the delivery of luxury goods to North Korean elites, or to North Koreans in general, but usually only elites can afford them, is prohibited as well. Infrastructure restrictions are targeting individuals, companies, or other organizations, and their access to their assets or financial services as well as the ability to travel across international borders. Additionally, <clears throat> because of the extraordinary complexity of North Korea's proliferation activities, the free flow of goods through the international transport system is restricted, for example, by denying bunkering services at seaports for North Korean vessels, ships, or by subjecting such vessels to onboard inspection in ports and even under certain circumstances on the high sea. Blocking of diplomatic privileges, certain educational services and free trade in cultural goods and services are a third group of sanctions measures against North Korea. These blocking measures are very unusual for the UN and in fact they only exist uh, for the North Korea sanctions regime and not for the 14 other current sanction regimes that the UN has. 
To counter the various threats that North Korea presents to the international community, the UN embargo not only need to block any income or incoming arms, but also deprive North Korea's significant domestic defense industry from any opportunity to supply arms and military equipment to other states, therefore also raise uh, revenues to North Korea. Similarly, and any component system, technology, or knowledge that could assist the development or production of uh, WMDs uh, is banned. Dual use items for conventional arms or weapons of mass destruction are also blocked. Many raw materials are prohibited from import to or export from North Korea. In part, this is because they are supplies to the world, uh, to the to the WMDs, but also they can be um, a significant source of revenue. Luxury sanctions are intended as a measure to touch North Korean leaders in a very personal and uh, hopefully also embarrassing manner uh, by depriving them access to, to these important uh, uh, signs of prestige. An embargo has also been imposed against labor forces that North Korea is uh, contracting to foreign entities in order to deprive to North Korea's proliferation project from deriving financial benefits from human trafficking the sanctions prohibit engagements of DPRK workers. We have another question uh, related to luxury goods and commodities, which is a broad category. Is there a specific list of the type of luxury goods that are banned? We will get into this a little bit later in this presentation, but no, it is actually a, a sort of an experimental um, uh, sanctions type that the UN decided uh, more than 13 years ago to, to try out by not defining it too concretely, thereby uh, creating a sense of unpredictability um, and heightening the potential embarrassment that the recipients of these luxury goods uh, could experience. One of the most complicated aspects of non-proliferation pro proliferation sanctions is the fact that many components or technologies are not immediately apparent to be part of a weapon system. These are very technical, complicated uh, gadgets, usually. Yet government officials and corporate compliance officers must be able to correctly identify these items and block them. Additionally, they must also recognize and understand what represents dual use items, as well as what item could fall under the catch-all provision, which can be any consumer item, regardless what it is, that will be used by or for North Korea's proliferation projects. Detailed guidance and identification tools are provided for these categories of embargoed materials by specialized arms control organizations. The handbook that we have created identifies the official lists and provides you with the links to the relevant documents. Essentially, the commodity embargo against DPRK, DPRK attempts to achieve two objectives. One is deny North Korea's proliferation projects access to or import any raw material. Two, deny North Korea's proliferators, in particular its business government conglomerates, of which we will speak later on, the ability to earn income from the export or trade with commodities, agricultural and industrial products. For many member states, these restrictions present challenging supply chain control issues, as well as for some countries that depend on North Korean raw materials, the need to find alternative supplies. Luxury sanctions measures were still and still are intentionally vague in response to the earlier question. Their intentions is to deprive North Korea's top elites, who typically are the promoters of the proliferation project from enjoying privileges at the expense of the already impoverished populations. The deliberate vagueness is intended to add <clears throat> anxieties to these elites and possibly embarrassments if they cannot obtain the desired luxuries. The ban on hiring North Korean labor forces is a response to what was observed to be a significant source of foreign currency income for the proliferation project. To cut off the sources of revenue, the ban on North Korean labor contingents working to foreign countries was imposed. North Korean observers of such labor workforces 
who usually are registered as diplomats are also to be expelled. Infrastructure sanctions are tools that prohibit the provision of certain services to individuals, companies, and other organizations or entities that tend to be most responsible for the international disturbances, the threats, the terrorism attacks, the atrocities. Traditionally, UN sanctions include an asset freeze and an individual travel ban. So they hit very personal interests. Denying access to private or corporate assets, to financial services, use of financial resources and services that enable trade or the procurement of prohibited material is considered to be one of the most effective UN sanctions measures. Denying designated individuals the ability to travel internationally curtails these most those most responsible proliferation and violence, the ability to procure embargoed materials, engage with other sanctions violators, disguise assets, or prohibit personal travel as a matter of elite's privileges. A relatively novel sanctions measure is the denial of certain services to ships or airplanes operating under the North Korean flag. These restrictions include the denial of fueling, or other port-related services to vessels that have been designated. The UN asset freeze, freeze's purpose has multiple uh, dimensions. It should deprive the principal culprits already under sanctions from the benefits of their existing assets, deny them access to new assets provided by third parties, or in the form of revenues of, or of business ventures or any other forms of illicit or illicit gains. The denial of financial services pertains to transfer of remittance services, the permitting of new financial service institutions or branches of North Korean banks, the operation of bank services operate, operations in the DPRK, and all types of financial instruments or financial transaction services in support of trade. The travel ban accomplishes multiple objectives. The travel bans are often also a humiliating and reputation damaging restriction to exercise a personal freedom that is often viewed as evidence for elite status. To, exacer to exacerbate the, the latter purpose, travel bans are often imposed not merely on the primary violator, but also on the entire family. On a more tactical level, the individual travel ban complicates access to foreign procurement markets for <clears throat> proliferation relevant material or to, to, source of foreign, to sources of foreign manufactured conventional arms, respectively for clients of North Korean manufactured weapons and military material. Thus, the travel ban targets anybody that operates directly or indirectly for sanctions violations or violators. The consequences of travel bans is that any individual designated must be repatriated to the country of citizenship or residence, but states must also proactively repatriate anybody they have evidence for violating any sanctions provision, assist the evasion in the evasion of sanctions, or travel for the purpose of pursuing prohibited activities. The maritime aviation restrictions is a sanctions tool through which states can intervene whenever they suspect a ship or an airplane to be to transport prohibited material or is owned or operated by someone already designated for sanctions. Suspicious cargo can be part, parts of or complete conventional arms systems. It can also be WND components or commodities. To invoke these sanctions, a state must have reasonable grounds to believe that cargo contains prohibited material, and it must inform the, la the flag state before it intervenes. The consequences include that the ship be searched in port, in coastal waters, or even on the high seas. <clears throat> Once prohibited cargo is found, it can be blocked, direct, that the ship can be directed to the nearest port, further searched, its locks inspected, and the crew interrogated, and finally, the vessel can be deflagged and deregistered so that North Korea can no longer operate it. A vessel approaching a port can be denied access, or once in a port, any service that would permit it to continue its journey. 
We have another question regarding North Korea's evade sanctions on their maritime activities. Wouldn't it be easy to just deny access of North Korea flagged ships to ports in Africa? We have to be careful with what we call over compliance. UN sanctions are not supposed to hurt innocent people, meaning North Koreans that have nothing to do with the proliferation project. So therefore, sanctions uh, are to be targeted very, very specifically to the sources of these destabilizing uh, factors. And of course, all the other legitimate trade that North Korea needs to have with the rest of the world uh, should actually be encouraged. That's fine. Blocking off diplomatic, educational, or cultural activities are very unusual matters that the UN never takes, except in some instances they are being, they are being imposed on North Korea. However, these measures were adopted in response to very specific observations having to de deal with uh, diplomats who are transgressing on their privileges, having to do with North Koreans uh, registering at international universities to learn sciences and technologies that are very particular to North Korea's uh, proliferation system and the uh, sale or, or production and sale of cultural goods which is an has turned into an important source of income for North Korea's proliferation project. In order to uh, enable North Korea's proliferation and conventional arms exports a whole hierarchy of government arms trading organizations uh, has developed over, over the decades. Uh, it's a management, but also an oversight network that is ch taking charge on all aspects of the development of these weapons, including foreign procurement and sales, often in contravention of international laws and regulations. And as you can see here, there are seven particular bureaus that are specialize in particular types of weapons. In addition to the governmental structure that oversees and manages all aspects of its defense industry, there are also a number of government-controlled corporate conglomerates that carry out international sales and acquisitions. Roughly speaking, main government branches have established and developed at least one conglomerate that operates in, the inter in, the, in their interest or as a front company. Over time, as UN sanctions investigators discover them and they are being subjected to UN sanctions, specifically to their asset freeze, they diminish in their usefulness. And so they are being uh, replaced by a new one. Comet is an example that after it was identified and sanctioned in 2009, uh, its some of its functions at least seem to have been replaced by Green Pine Associated Company, which is now also on the sanctions. Tang Kun and Nam Hong Yang trading corporations both have remained relatively unknown despite that they are under sanctions and they may continue to be active without having been identified nor their, their activities have become visible. We simply don't know. Korea Mining, uh, Office 39 is a legendary but secretive organization that the Korean government uh, has developed, has set up. Uh, it's it's identified by many researchers and authors as having been involved in all kinds of mostly illicit and criminal activities. Operators associated with Office 39 are alleged to be involved in the drug trade, counterfeit money, abduction and ransoming of foreigners, uh, particularly South Koreans and Japanese citizens, and many uh, dual, typically dual citizens, um, Koreans, North Koreans of origin, but they have may, may have migrated a long time ago to South Korea or, or Japan. But Office 39 is also involved in many other criminal activities to raise essentially foreign exchange revenues. Office 39 was put on the sanctions, meaning that its accounts uh, were frozen, except that this is not an organization that opens an account with Deutsche Bank or Citibank. Mm -hmm. The effect is therefore not necessarily to block asset, assets, but to simply message to the world that by international standards, this is not an acceptable organization. 
The same goes, of course, for all the other state entities that are related directly to the proliferation and military efforts of North Korea. COMET is an operation that was discovered at least seven to eight years ago. Its activities span from traditional arms trades to construction of military facilities, particularly in African countries, to acting as a general contractor and government intermediary for Manzuade overseas group, which creates statues and other works of arts that can be admired now in many capitals, not only in African, on the African continent, but across the globe. Commit branches, affiliates, or associated entities appear to be overseen by the Second Economic Committee, as you recall, the previous organizational uh, overview, and a very important high-ranking organization. Commit probably collaborates with many of the bureaus dealing with different categories of arms. An important aspect of Commit is that it has often operated as general contractor and a sales agent or marketing agent for Mansuari Overseas Project an important revenue producer for North Korea. Far less information uh, is available about a Green Pine Associated Corporation. It appears to be operated much more carefully than Comid used to be operated. Uh, GPA, GPCA seems also more closely supervised by the very senior reconnaissance general bureau. Uh, GPAC has, in addition to facilitating government-to-government -government defense related work, also syndicated North Korea's long-standing tunnel building skills that uh, North Koreans have developed during the Korean War when uh, they build massive fortifications into the rocks that uh, uh, are, are prevalent along the 38 uh, North borderline with South Korea. These tunnel building skills are now an export service that allegedly was sold to Iran for its proliferation project, its underground facilities, to Libya for its large scale water transport systems, where they brought water from the Sahara to the northern, uh, much more uh, fertile field regions, and to Hamas and Hezbollah for its underground network along the Gaza Strips ported to Israel and Egypt. Green Pine Associated Corporation and its affiliates, as you can see, appear to be operating mainly within the sympathetic Chinese jurisdiction. The relative paucity of information about specific activities may be an indication of the far more cautious management of GPAC, but is certainly uh, by no means this graph indicates that we know of all the involvements it has uh, around the world. Heng Yung Gang is an example of what is believed to be a conglomerate that to date remains relatively obscure. Actually, it is most spec mostly speculations at this point that is available about Heng Yung Gang, and an indication for the comparative information lack is the fact that this organization is not even designated for sanctions by the UN. In very recent years, indications have emerged according to the UN's panel of experts that the company has a subsidiary in Mozambique, and the key individual appears to be operating from the DPRK embassy in Pretoria, and perhaps in Tanzania. The allegations indicate that individual, uh, individuals associated with Hang Yum Gang were involved in a $6 million con dollar contract uh, for the supply of manned portable air defense systems, surface-to-air missiles, and radar to Mozambique. The alleged transactions also involved apparently the refurbishment of T-55 tanks and the modernization of the surface-to-air Pecora missile system. Foreign Trade Bank is, a North, Korea's, is North Korea's principal international banking system, paying among other legitimate activities also North Korea's uh, UN membership uh, dues. But FTB has been discovered and ultimately put on the sanctions list pro for providing financial services for and involvement with the DPRK's proliferation projects and its conglomerates, including its many diplomatic and, and conglomerates representatives around the world. 
that obviously require international banking services. You have a question in regard whether more information about each of these North Korean companies and their activities are available in activities in Africa are available in the CCSI handbook. Yes, we are trying to uh, include as much confirmed and, 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 and uh, good information about these companies, and we are also continuing our research in additional, as of yet unknown, conglomerates, and we will add them. Uh, perhaps also issue some um, further case studies that that explain uh, what this particular problem uh, entails. Ocean Maritime Management Company uh, is perhaps one of the most investigated and yet still elusive North Korean, Korean conglomerates because of its frantic as a an owner, a ship owner, essentially, of many, many uh, maritime vessels. It's frantic reflagging and re-registrations of vessels that it operates uh, makes it uh, very uh, difficult to, to pursue uh, and identify a company. Sometimes directly, but more often also acting through subsidiaries and front companies that are registered across the world in many different countries. Uh, it is almost like a chameleon with the chips constantly changing names and registrations and flaggings, often disguising its, uh, its, its actual origin. And we have a question. The, the size of the North Korean controlled flag is fluctuating, in part because a number of ships have been blocked and no longer can sail, but also because North Koreans seem to be able to find ways to integrate new ships on the different flags that are not easily traceable back to its true North Korean ownership. But I think at one point, Ocean Maritime Management Company had over 60 cargo vessels uh, sailing under its name. We have to think about what member states and companies can do to actually meaningfully participate in the implementation of UN sanctions. And we are, uh, we have designed a, a theoretical, a conceptual approach to this that we call the whole of government sanctions implementation mechanism. Uh, this mechanism is meant to, to uh, help states, all states, uh, in their implementation efforts, including guide them to how to report their actions relevant to, sanction, to, to sanctions violations, observed sanctions violations, but also measures that they just institute preventively so that no sanctions violation occurs. And then, of course, they have a reporting obligation to the sanction committee for North Korea. Because UN sanctions include increasingly complex packages of measures, no single government agency can take responsibility for their correct implementation. It is therefore imperative that the national coordination mechanism is created. Usually, it should be headed by a senior official of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to inform, coordinate, and report the specific implementation actions by the many affected government branches and agencies. The prerequisites are, of course, a policy supported by the executive level of a country that uh, imbue the mechanism with political will to provide necessary capacities and funds, the information and skills required to overcome the often technical challenges uh, uh, that a state will face. While the core UN sanctions measures are arms embargoes, asset freezes, and individual travel bans, in most cases, many other supporting restrictions, bans, or blocking actions are applied, usually custom-tailored measures to shape a response to a specific threat or risk actors. This list of government functions illustrate some of the activities states are expected to activate to implement uh, the DPRK sanctions measures. An example of not 
overly obvious activity is the oversight and arm stock management functions. Without them functioning reliably, no state can claim with certainty to be able to be aware of and prevent arms embargo violations before they occur, or at least investigate and trace any irregularities until the full set of facts for a possible embargo violation, for example, by stealing arms or ammunition from uh, stockpiles uh, is being established. Policy makers and regulators must accept the responsibility to, to contribute towards a mandate for an effective national sanctions implementation coordination that is flexible enough to allow the integration of many measures without lengthy judicial or parliamentary proceedings. Inbuilt into their policies must also be the ability to quickly adjust in the Security Council uh, when the Security Council adopts a category of measures that so far has not been known or applied. Sanctions measures must be versatile and enable quick political reactions to emerging threats and risks in international peace and security. And in a nutshell, they, they do that when these three core functions are addressed, provide information, circum circumscribe implementation objectives, and authorize enforcement. Relevant sanctions implementation information includes obviously the UN sanctions list that, that, that uh, identifies those designated under UN sanctions, but also in, not only individuals, but also companies and entities, but also identifies spe specific items there that are under embargo. Commercial screening tools broaden the information contained on the lists, but their applications can lead, if used imprudently, to overcompliance which is not in the interest of the UN policymakers. The flip side of the information coin are due diligence standards. How intrusive must a government or a company be in order to meet its implementation obligations? Many industries recognize that their specific processes cause specific compliance guidelines, uh, compliance challenges and have developed sensible guidelines. They must be known and understood. The correct application of individual exemptions to sanctions measures responds to the UN's need to be fair and respect human rights. All governments must distinguish between other sanctions for issued by other sanctions uh, by, by other political entities and the sanctions that issued are issued by the UN and the Security Council, which they must implement as a matter of legal obligations because of their membership with the UN. Connecting with the previous point, the implementation of UN sanctions is not elective, but mandatory for all UN member states, regardless whether supporting laws and regulations are in place. Uh, I have a question here. Where can I find the UN sanctions list? Or what if I have questions for the UN panel of experts? Uh, in our handbook, there is actually a link, a uh, hyperlink directly to the UN sanctions list, yeah, and we will update that um, frequently. And questions to the panel, UN panel of experts is probably not uh, what one should be concerned with. If one a state uh, has a question, then he, he or she should address this question to the sanctions committee for the DPRK. And if then some specific technical issues arise that the panel of experts uh, should be responding to, it's for the sanction committee and its chairperson to facilitate that communication. The National Government's Frontline Sanction Act is also distributed across many branches and ministries. Often, critical personnel are not high-ranking officials, but are border control agents, coast guards, air traffic controllers, bank supervisory agents, or trade control officers, each require very specific instructions in order to effectively apply sanctions restrictions to their field of responsibility. Similarly to the whole of government uh, sanctions implementation system, we also recommend that internationally active companies uh, establish a whole of enterprise sanctions compliance system 
it is also based on the broad collaboration across many corporate actors and many branches of, of a company uh, who all must be directed ultimately from one executive level uh, coordination uh, point. However, what is very important to uh, realize is that companies really face in many ways a far, far more complex uh, compliance challenge because they need to comply with the implementation requirements imposed by governments of states, of all the states in which they are active. For very large internationally active company, this could easily mean that they have to deal with a hundred sanctions regimes. Uh, and that's a challenge that uh, m must be part of the cost of doing business. At the same time, one should also realize that um, the potentially steep penalties that most uh, commercial actors usually fear when they hear the, 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 the term sanctions uh, is not the full story. There are risks and downsides for sure, but there are also upsides. There are also opportunities. This discussion, these discussions must be, must be had on a corporate level in order to recognize potential benefits uh, that the company can actually derive from san sanctions. Some of these upsides have to do with broad economical considerations such, uh, such as the standard setting F effect uh, and favorable business conditions that uh, can result from peace, well, that usually result always from peace, uh, and of course also for uh, ensuring fair competition. Among the concrete advantages that sanctions have brought to business is the creation of a multi-billion dollar service opportunity for companies specializing in due diligence and compliance tools and services. There are many other ways how uh, companies can benefit as long as it is realized that, yes, it is a set of rules, but at the same time, the set of rules uh, also communicates international, globally applicable standards that can be enforced through the Security Council. The most senior level of corporate management should define a mandate for a corporate-wide sanctions compliance mechanism that minimally should obligate all employees and other stakeholders to buy, abide by all sanctions requirements. Further, such as directive should define an implementation strategy and clear directives for all business branches that could potentially be affected by sanctions. Fundamentally, a corporate sanctions compliance policy must ensure that clear tactical compliance guidance is available for all employees and stakeholders, that the compliance obligations are fully understood and incorporated into their workflow, and finally, that all operative sections of the company fully understand their reporting obligations to the executive level compliance mechanism. There are three core competencies that, that need to be mastered having to do with information, with compliance, and with reporting. In terms of information, the pertinent information for corporate compliance systems has to include executive level directives and, and guidance. It has to be animated with the data obtained from UN sanctions lists, not only for those designated, but also for embargoed items. Instructions that help all employees and stakeholders to fully understand their compliance obligations including where necessary any exemptions that are part of the UN sanction system and are very important in order to maintain its, its human rights integrity, uh, as well as applicable due diligence obligations or guidance that any companies in their own self-interest, of course, wants to practice. And finally, for the most sensitive branches of corporate activities, such as the compliance and legal professionals, access to commercially available compliance tools that are widely available in many different languages however costly they are. They may be probably most their value, their price. Corporate leaders need to understand that the implementation of UN sanctions is a legal obligation under international law. Even if one does business under a government that is skeptical of UN sanctions or outright uh, rejects UN sanctions, the company still has an obligation to comply 
with UN sanctions. Depending on the industries in which an enterprise is active, a wide range of operative departments may have to live up to their compliance obligations. Examples are listed on this slide, but corporate compliance specialists should always keep in mind that sanctions compliance is never a matter of rigid checklists, but must be a flexible and risk responsive procedure. In the following, we have a number of lists uh, that we have drawn from the daily experiences of sanctions um, practitioners that may help to identify uh, risks or also uh, risk actors. <clears throat> Experiences uh, accumulating over the years uh, for a number of behavioral patterns that sanctions violators may display, uh, depending on what sanctions measures they want to contravene, um, are listed here. In keeping with the situation-specific and flexible corporate compliance approach, but also for an equivalent government implementation approach, uh, we are listing the following topology slides. The observance of one or two of these behaviors should not be interpreted as evidence for a sanctions violation. They merely flag the need for additional due diligence, attention, and perhaps the, inclu the inclusion or the recruitment of a subject matter expert to conduct more in-depth investigations. These slides, this slide summarizes trade practices. For each one of these actions, they, there may be perfectly good justifications, but they may also be a sign for trouble. Similarly, border control agents or corporate logistics experts may encounter behavior as described in this slide. While many of the indicated actions may represent a violation of national laws and regulations, it is not imperative that they also indicate a sanctions violation. While mismatches and incomplete filings are vital sanctions violated tools, they may also result from honest mistakes or immediate other causes. On a more sophisticated level, manipulations of transportation systems and its rules tend to reflect deliberate deceptions. Their occurrences should be considered indicators of at least malvolent intentions and require determined and deep follow-up investigations. In cases where exports require reviews and approvals from export license source, awareness of all sanctions restrictions, including on dual use and catch-all provisions is a prerequisite. The enforcement protocols should be updated frequently with lessons learned and trusted private sector parties should be informed and consulted periodically about any changes or observed regularities. Because most border enforcement agencies and agents do not have readily available expertise on non-proliferation sanctions, specifically the ability to determine whether cargo may fall under restricted categories, categories it is essential to customs and border control agents have effective access to government agencies that possess these competencies. Typically, this would be trade control and technical agencies. As the line of first defense, border control agents should conduct checks for consistencies in filings and shipping documents to ensure no mismatches are overlooked, including the application of detection technologies. Thanks to a large, large part by the ready availability of commercial compliance data banks and systems, financial industry oversight authorities' insistence on the full application of FATF recommendations, the Financial Actions Task Force, uh, is by today's standards an indispensable and simply not elective. Government institutional knowledge can, however, also play an important role in evaluating potentially unacceptable actions. One starting point for applicants or entities appearing to display potentially suspicious behavior or cited on suspicious transaction reports, a look back to other pertinent actions should be routine. Relevant records to review are previous suspicious transactions, citations by border control agencies or WMD related applications to export permits in the past that may have been rejected. <clears throat> 
For the private sector industry, specific observations and actions must be applied to identify potential integrity problems, connect the typical, connecting typically uh, with sanctions violations. Defense and dual use manufacturers need to cultivate awareness in regards to buyer's business environment, history and track record in regards to end use and user certifications or competence that should match technologies and items that the client intends to acquire. Within the transportation sector, there are particular risks and challenges. Uh, we define them in two categories, operators and clients. In regards to operators of maritime or aviation vessels or transportation service providers, uh, shipping brokers, etc., guidance developed by the World Customs Organization should be observed carefully. Checks should go to the legitimacy of the vessel safety records, registration status, history and integrity of owners on record. The identity of cargo consignors and the specific cargo must be verified as well as the transportation route, the use of shipping intermediaries, whether or not they are conventional or uh, it seem to indicate uh, very, very unusual routings. In all cases, participants' records of previous activities, even if no criminality is present, is part of appropriate due diligence. A, com a question um, is raised in connection with a compliance officer tasked with conducting due diligence. Uh, what is it supposed to do? How is it? How do I convince my superiors that maybe more interest in revenue generation and sanction enforcement is important too? This is the eternal battle uh, that every compliance officer uh, has to wage, and. Uh, as a compliance officer, I would recommend to keep a log of public, publicly reported cases where a company ends up paying huge fines or is suffering severe reputational damage because of sanctions violations. We have seen this in the financial industry in particular, where uh, many, many banks, most international banks at one point or another uh, were caught uh, violating sanctions. Uh, the result is that with all the fines that have been imposed, not by the UN, but by others, uh, have risen gradually, first from a few hundred million dollars to the, by now, the, the largest penalty that was paid by uh, an international bank was $9.5 billion. So if that doesn't help well, then I suppose uh, maybe it's time to find another job. <laughs> uh, the question, an additional question is, example of those fines and sanctions can be found in the case studies included in the CCSI handbook and CCSI websites. Uh, no, I'm sorry, we don't, uh, we have not done that, but we may actually start a, a log of um, current news on sanctions, and in that instance, then, when we have instituted that, we will act absolutely uh, just update that on a daily basis. It's a good idea. Thank you for the question. Benefiting from the relatively advanced dual diligence uh, due diligence practice is common among the global financial industry. Banks and other financial industry participants should carefully follow FATF recommendations. These are the 40 recommendations that the Financial Action Task Force uh, publishes after massive consultations with, with uh, not just the financial industry, but uh, a whole range of, of, of characters. And it has become the gold standard for uh, compliance in the financial sector. In addition, using perhaps commercially available compliance tools, banks should ensure that clients with regulatory records or any other known integrity challenges are subjected to careful reviews. Importantly, banks should, however, avoid blanket rejections of clients from regions on the sanctions as overcompliance increasingly imposes unacceptable burdens on civilians and on innocent civilians. And that, of course, also diminishes 
the credibility and the reputation of the UN sanctions, which uh, really would not be a good casualty. Finally, to conclude this presentation, what applies to the banking industry is even more pertinent to the financial intermediaries. Those are the ones that are perhaps most exposed to uh, shady characters and sanctions violations, violators. Too often they are being employed as screens against aggressive due diligence practice by the primary uh, financial industry participants, the banks, the large banks. Financial intermediaries have the same obligations as banks, including the filing of suspicion, suspicious transaction reports to their governments. They should subject clients to vigorous vetting when their in, intended business or financial activities appears to significantly veer off uh, any recognized norms. Additional due diligence is required when clients engage in transactions with military items or technologies or with industry participants that are known to deal with WMD components, technologies, um, conventional arms or any other services that uh, is considered to be sensitive. Well, thank you very much for your attention and don't hesitate if you uh, would like to have any further questions addressed uh, to contact us directly. You'll find us on our website. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rico. Uh, for that great presentation uh, and very uh, well-informed and concise discussion of current sanctions requirements and the tools you can do as a compliance officer, as a government regulator, uh, to improve your whole-of-government, whole-of-enterprise approach to sanctions enforcement. Uh, thank you to everyone who participated in this webinar. Again, the UN Sanctions Implementation Handbook and the webinars can be downloaded on CCSI's website at www.comcapint.org, where you can find the English, Amharic, Swahili, and other language versions of these materials, as well as the link on the top right of this page, uh, which is the uh, box that says web links for the handbook, as well as the website. Uh, this concludes our webinar, and thank you very much for participating.